Comedy has been around since the dawn of language. It goes back to the days of cavemen making fun of each other's tooth. But how did it become the art form it is today? Well, let's take a look and find out, shall we? So join us as we take a look at the brief history of stand-up comedy. And don't forget, there's a two-drink minimum, because there's nothing funnier than the price of drinks at a club. First off, entertaining people with comedy is nothing new. A great example of how far back comedy goes would be to take a look at the traditional jesters employed during the medieval times. Jesters were essentially king's personal comedians. They would dress up like crayons and tell jokes to create a light-hearted environment. In many instances, jesters were the only ones allowed to joke about sensitive topics. That's kind of like going to North Korea and there being one guy that can joke about how the entire country seems like it's an open-air dungeon trapped in a time warp. But stand-up as we know it today was very much inspired by live performance. Particularly the type of performance often found in vaudeville, minstrel shows, and burlesque shows. Vaudeville was a night of entertainment where there was a mix of different types of performances. There was humor, dance, music, magic, acrobatics. Vaudeville was like buying the variety pack of cereal. You don't just get Fruit Loops, you get Frosted Flakes, you get Cookie Crisps, you get Golden Grahams so you have something to throw out. You get a bit of all of them, only instead of cereal, it's a variety pack of entertainment. And one of those forms of entertainment was comedy. Minstrel shows were somewhat similar to vaudeville in that they also often included comedy, music, and dance, only they wanted to add more bigotry and hatred. So essentially, the punchline of every joke at a minstrel show was racism. And burlesque shows were also similar to vaudeville shows, only instead of adding racism like the minstrel shows, they wanted to add more strippers. Burlesque shows thought vaudeville had too many clothes. But although there were differences between these three forms of entertainment, all three allowed people to go on stage and use humor to connect with an audience. As the 1900s progressed, comedy moved away from these types of shows and started to establish itself as a sole performance. One that could pull an audience all by itself. It was all grown up. Comedians moved from being one part of a show to being the entire show itself. And suddenly, clubs were being designed specifically for comedy performance. Stand-up involved a single performer delivering a routine, sometimes about personal experiences, sometimes it was social commentary, sometimes it was just one-liners about everyday life. Different comedians had different styles which is what added depth to the art form. Comedy really hit its stride after World War II. There weren't just nightclubs for comedy now. Now there were also comedy records and radio broadcasts that focused on comedy. No longer were comedians only confined to a room of chuckling clubgoers. Now they were beaming their jokes across the entire country. If you had a radio or you could find your way to a record store, you could listen to a comedy act without the need for a club. Bob Hope and Jack Benny were two iconic comedians of the time, and both of them had their own radio shows, allowing them to help lay the foundation for humor to stand on its own. It's worse than horrible because a zombie has no will of his own. You see them sometimes, walking around blindly with dead eyes, following orders, not knowing what they do, not caring. You mean like Democrats? Jump ahead to the 1950s. TV also became a big part of the comedy party. At the time, a lot of comedy duos arrived with people like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and Abbott and Costello. Comedy duos often followed the same formula. One person would be more like the straight man setting up the jokes, and the other was the wacky, lovable sidekick with the exaggerated personality who was armed with the punchline. Now, wait a minute. You claim that all that added up amounts to what? 28. These types of duos represented the flavor of comedy at the time. It often involved silly banter between the two and frequently relied on wordplay, but very rarely offensive or controversial. Amid the social upheaval of the 1960s, comedians dug even deeper into taboo topics. Whereas the acts of the 1950s tended to be more clean-cut, with occasional innuendo here and there, the 60s added more attitude to the comedy genre. 
The late 1950s into the early 1960s led to the emergence of Lenny Bruce, one of comedy's first rebels. He didn't just tell jokes. He was a philosophical revolutionary in many ways. He threw a Molotov cocktail at issues like religion, politics, and sex. If social norms were a house, Lenny Bruce was the guy crashing the party. He was the guy saying, let's talk about all the stuff everybody else pretends doesn't happen. And yes, he did it with a sprinkle of vulgarity because, well, subtlety wasn't his strong suit. I have a, a reputation for being sort of controversial and irreverent and also the semantic bear trap of bad taste. He was actually arrested for using vulgarity and charged with public lewdness. It didn't curb his act, though. He continued to speak his mind about controversial topics, becoming an icon of free speech. Even though Lenny Bruce died young, not even surviving the decade, his influence lingered. And ironically, his outspoken, brash, uncouth approach occurred at the same time another comedian was gaining popularity, Bill Cosby. Frankenstein and a mummy are about the two slowest guys in the world. I don't understand how they could even catch people. Bill Cosby took the exact opposite approach. He refused to use vulgarity. And throughout his career, he often criticized comedians that did use vulgarity. So, the 1960s created two opposing genres for future comedy. The clean-cut traditional comedian, led by guys like Cosby, and the more rebellious, outspoken comedy of people like Bruce. As a matter of fact, Bill Cosby's career lasted for decades, and throughout it all, he maintained his clean, family-friendly image, advocating only for clean comedy. And lots of comedians drank the Kool-Aid with him. Well, at least up until the point where people learned that they should probably not drink anything with him. Or from him. Ever. Fast forward to the 1970s, where Richard Pryor and George Carlin stepped into the comedy spotlight. Both comedians had been performing throughout the 1960s, but the 1970s is where they blew up. Pryor, the maestro of personal storytelling, turned his life experiences into comedic gold. He would often draw from his troubled upbringing, his struggles with addiction, and his experiences with race and class issues. His ability to share personal stories with raw honesty resonated with audiences, and it set a new standard for authenticity in comedy. I remember this one, it striped a match like this. I said, what's that Richard Pryor running down the street? Now, while Pryor spoke about life experiences, Carlin, the wordsmith extraordinaire, took on social issues and, in many ways, was the spiritual successor to Lenny Bruce. Taylor, Tyler, Jordan, Flynn, these are not real names. <laughs> one of Carlin's most famous routines was where he discussed the seven dirty words. These were the words that were considered inappropriate for broadcast on television and radio. Both Richard Pryor and George Carlin would go on to become iconic comedians who inspired generations to come. By the 1980s, stand-up comedy was blowing up like a balloon at a clown convention. Eddie Murphy was one of Saturday Night Live's comedy prodigies. He didn't just present himself like a comedian, he took the stage like a rock star. His comedy specials, Delirious and Raw, were so massive that they weren't shown on TV, they were shown in theaters. People dropped cash for tickets and popcorn to go watch Eddie Murphy in his red dominatrix attire, standing there like a crimson cow, establishing himself as an icon for the era. You don't have no eyes. You didn't get na. You didn't get na. You didn't get na. You didn't get na. Cause you are on the welfare. Eddie Murphy proved that comedy could be a blockbuster experience. The 80s were also a time where female comics were breaking through the glass ceiling with performers like Janine Garofalo, Whoopi Goldberg, and Ellen DeGeneres becoming more popular, in large part due to the trailblazing efforts of Joan Rivers, who in the previous decades had established herself as a huge voice in comedy. A girl, you're 30 years old, you're not married, you're an old maid. A man, he's 90 years old, he's not married, he's a catch. It's a whole different thing. <laughs> it also led to lots of sitcom opportunities that bled into the 1990s, Tons of comedians were being offered their own TV shows. None were more successful at it than Jerry Seinfeld. Seinfeld, the man who turned nothing into something, parlayed his stand-up into a fortune through his sitcom, which was essentially his entire act turned into a show. And he wasn't alone on the TV stardom train. There was Tim Allen, Martin Lawrence, Roseanne Barr, Drew Carey, Steve Harvey, Ellen DeGeneres, Ray Romano, even Bob Saget, 
Bob Saget was a notoriously vulgar comedian, known for working blue, the industry term used to refer to risque material. And even he got himself a role on a TV show, ironically, playing a super nerdy, uber wholesome dad on Full House. It was like casting Arnold Schwarzenegger as the nerd at school who gets bullied. It made the complete opposite of sense, but yet it worked. Even talk shows were fair game. Chevy Chase, Dennis Miller, Jay Leno, and of course the kingpin of late night wit, David Letterman, were all comedians who took their shot at entertaining us from behind a desk. So the 80s and the 90s were great for comedians. They opened doors for comedians to become more than comedians if they wanted. And in many instances, they became megastars. During the 1990s, Comedy Central was also established. Comedy Central was the channel that said, hey, why not have a whole platform for this comedy madness? Because who wouldn't want 24-7 access to laughter? Comedy Central showcased stand-up, sitcoms, talk shows, even animation. All of them seeped in laughter. The comedy scene at the turn of the century was a time when diversity hit the comedy world harder than ever. Comedy was taking on all new forms. Previously, a lot of comedians used stand-up as a platform that they hoped would elevate them into acting opportunities in TV or film. But now, comedians were using stand-up to vault them into all types of different directions. Dave Chappelle turned his comedy into a sketch show that became one of the most iconic shows of the time period. Daniel Tosh got himself a show, Tosh.0, in which he would make fun of popular internet clips and memes. Some comedians parlayed their stand-up into hosting opportunities. Steve Harvey became host of The Family Feud. Drew Carey became host of The Price is Right. Jeff Foxworthy became host of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Spoiler alert, we're not. Meanwhile, lots of people morphed stand-up comedy into sit-down comedy. Jon Stewart turned his stand-up into a news parody show, exploring social and political issues. It was like George Carlin and Dennis Miller had a love child, and its name was The Daily Show. Joe Rogan parlayed his comedy career into a podcast that he sold for the price of a small planet. Furthermore, technology also contributed to the reimagination of stand-up, with YouTube, podcasting, satellite radio, TikTok, Twitter, or X, or X-Twitter, Twitter X, whatever they want to call it. Suddenly, people could become famous for being funny without having to go on stage and do stand-up comedy. Although the last several decades has shown that lots of comedians use stand-up as a stepping stone into acting, interviewing, and even music, the art of stand-up is very much as revered as ever. Furthermore, comedians like Dave Chappelle have emerged not only as joke tellers, but as modern philosophers, raising questions and challenging norms which, while not always popular with all people, do make people think and get people talking, which is important for people to do in modern democracies, especially as times change and life evolves. Comedy has become essential in that way. Not bad for a job that once required people to dress up like a two-horned Christmas beast. While technology is impacting nearly every aspect of entertainment through virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, all of which could certainly be applied to stand-up as well, the importance and influence of comedy rests in its simplicity. One person, one microphone, one audience. That's all it takes to get people to laugh and to think all at the same time. And that will forever be the legacy of stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm.